Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Miriam Gershow, an instructor of composition in the English department at the University of Oregon. Gershow is a novelist, short story writer, and teacher. Her debut novel, The Local News, was published by Spiegel and Grau in February 2009. It has been called unusually credible and precise and deftly heartbreaking by the New York Times. And Kirkus Reviews adds that it has unsentimental, a disarmingly unsentimental narrative voice. The local news was a finalist for the Oregon Book Awards just in 2009. Gershaw is the recipient of a fiction fellowship from the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, as well as an Oregon Literary Fellowship. Her stories appear in the Georgia Review, Quarterly West, Black Warrior Review, Nimrod International Journal, The Journal, and Gulf Coast, among others. Her stories have been included in the 100 Other Distinguished Stories of 2006, which is listed in the Best of American Short Stories 2007, and appeared in the 2008 Robert Olin Butler Prize Stories. She has also been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Gershaw received her MFA in creative writing from the University of Oregon. She has taught fiction writing at Portland State University and at the University of Wisconsin. Miriam, welcome. Thank you very much. We're so excited to have you come, especially just after the book awards. It's very exciting. It's a great moment to have you come and talk to us. Much of your writing has been in short story mm -hmm. form. So I'm curious, now that you've got this wonderful novel out, what caused you to switch to a novel? Yeah, that's a great question. I, for years, I feel like I learned how to write with the short story. And the nature of MFA programs with the workshop format really encourages the writing of short stories. They're easy to talk about in a group. They're easy to pick apart as a whole. Um, and so I became very good at writing short stories, or I at least felt like I was mastering writing short stories. And I really enjoyed it. And I considered myself a short story writer. Um, but I was very naive to the marketplace. I had a short story collection finished and I was looking for an agent and everyone told me um, an agent's not going to take you unless you tell them you're working on a novel next because short story collections don't make money and novels do. And I hadn't considered these sort of things. I was very much writing with my head in the sand. So when I was writing letters querying agents, I included the, a line that said, my next project is a novel which I'm already working on, um, which was a lie. Um, and I thought it would take me a long time to find an agent, and it only took me three months. Um, and she's a wonderful agent. And in our first conversation, she said, tell me about your novel. And I had this idea of a young girl going around her neighborhood giving out posters of her missing brother and getting in a fight with a convenience store clerk, which is a scene that makes it into the book. And I just told her about that idea. And she said, great. And luckily, she didn't ask for pages for several more months. Um, and everyone's predictions turned out to be true. The short story collection never did sell. Um, but people were really interested in the writing, and they waited for my novel. So there was like a list of editors waiting to see this who had liked the short story collection but didn't want to buy it because they didn't think it would make them any money. Boy, that's a kind of production story that's really fueled by the realities of the market. A absolutely, which was like a crash course for me. I have other writer friends who are so well versed in how the market works. You know, they know who all the agents are, they know the publishing houses, they they really understand the whole process. For me, I find that deeply, deeply distracting when I'm writing. I just get so wrapped up in it that I freeze um, and I get really self-conscious and I can't get anything down on the page. So even now with a second book um, that I'm working on, I just need to pretend like it's all in a bubble, not that I'm going to try to eventually sell it one day. It makes sense to me that the creative process is not at all the same as the marketing process. A absolutely, absolutely. But in that switch from the short story to a full-length novel, you have to move from a, a genre that has a real economy of scale right. and a real density to it and has to come to closure very quickly. Right. And then suddenly you've got this lovely, long novel right. with lots of great dialogue in it. And right. Was it difficult for you to conceive of the longer piece? You know, this novel really was a gift for me in that it came more easily than most of my work comes to me. I labored for five years over the short story collection. And the book took two years, the local news. Um, and right now I'm back to sort of 
pulling my hair out with my latest project, which is my normal mode. I really enjoyed writing this. I loved the fat middle where I could just play around with things, where there didn't have to be that economy. There were times in the middle that I didn't really know where things were going, and I just followed it um, for chapters and chapters. And I was like, wow, a chapter doesn't have to tidily resolve. And that was so nice. And it was wonderful not to have to write nine endings, to only have one ending. But I have to say the ending is what I struggled with the most because after 360 pages, the need for a satisfying ending, I wasn't used to how much people would want, how much readers would want out of an ending versus investing in a 20 page story. You can sort of, I mean, endings are always important, but you can sort of get away with a weaker, slightly weaker ending still in a good story. It do, but when people invest days and days or weeks and weeks in reading something, they really want the ending to sing. So I revised and revised and revised the ending more than any other part of the book. It sounds as though the fat middle was enough to convince you that it's time to write a second one though, right? Something about the process. Yeah, I really fell in love with novel writing. I think story writing is really hard and I think all writing can be really hard um, and requires the economy and the discipline um, that at the time I really fell in love with. It's a great way to teach yourself writing um, or to learn writing through something like an MFA program, but the freedom that came with the novel and the investment I had in the characters was just really enticing. I found myself naturally wanting to write another novel again, not because of the marketplace. I mean, everyone assumed, oh, are you going to go back to stories after you sell a novel? And I was really excited to jump back into another novel. I want to get back to the, the heart of this one. I wonder if you could give us a brief synopsis, at least your synopsis, yeah. of what this novel's about. Um, this novel I always envisioned as a coming of age story. It's about Lydia Pasternak, who when she's 15 years old, her 18 year old um, older brother disappears one night. She's always been the bookish, socially awkward child. He's always been the charismatic, popular child. and. It's about how she comes of age with his disappearance in the background. Um, and the, what really interested me was how someone would grapple with all of the normal parts of coming of age, like finding your own identity, dealing with burgeoning sexuality, dealing with family and school and peers. Um, but also, I loved what the disappearance did in terms of, I wanted to know what someone would do if they were left behind in a disappearance and they had ambivalent feelings about who disappeared. So they weren't all together sad about it. Um, they grapple, had to grapple with mixed feelings. I think many books, many good ones, are written about people devastated by a disappearance, but I was more interested in what if someone was secretly relieved or yeah, secretly liked the attention or you know, was reveling in it in a way that teenagers revel in misery and tragedy, what what would that be like for Lydia? So that's what I was really interested in looking at. We couldn't resist the temptation to ask you to read, and you have graciously <laughs> agreed to do so. So you're I'm going to read to. us the very beginning, is that right? Yes, I'll read the first couple of paragraphs. That'd be great, thank okay. you. After my brother went missing, my parents let me use their car whenever I wanted, even though I only had a learner's permit. They didn't enforce my curfew. I didn't have to ask to be excused from the dinner table. The dinner table, in fact, had all but disappeared, covered with posters of Danny, a box of yellow ribbons that our whole neighborhood had tied around trees and mailboxes and car antennas, and piles of the letters we'd gotten from people praying for Danny's safe return, or who thought they saw him hitchhiking along a highway a couple of states away. I didn't have to do any more chores. Years later, I joined a support group for siblings of missing or exploited kids. It was amazing how a group of like-minded individuals could make the most singular and self-defining of circumstances feel simply mundane. I suppose for some, such a thing would be normalizing, since everyone in the circle of couches and folding chairs had experienced equivalent tragedy. For me, it was deeply disconcerting. I had no idea how to compete with other people's misery. 
It was in that group that I heard about the two types of parents, clingers and drifters. The clingers became micromanagers and wildly overprotective, tightening the reins, imposing new rules, smothering their kids with unwanted attention, buying gifts like a canopy bed or a new stereo system. The drifters, on the other hand, lost themselves to some mysterious netherworld, existing on coffee and crackers and minutes of sleep per night. They forgot to take the garbage out. They let the kitchen floor grow sticky. They looked like they were listening when they spoke to you. They became expert at empathetic nodding. But really, they were just staring past you, glassy-eyed. The concerns of the corporeal world became inconsequential to them, except for the fine, red-hot point of finding their child. Not you, their other child. Aside from that, they, well, drifted. My parents were drifters. I have to say that those couple of paragraphs sucked me into the novel immediately. Nice. I couldn't put it down. I just had to keep going. Oh, great. You said that what you presented to your agent that day as you were making up this novel <laughs> on the fly was that this idea you had had the scene in your head about a girl taking posters around and then having to negotiate that right. and the conflict with the convenience store owner. But on the whole issue of missing kids, in one of your earlier interviews, you said that you just didn't do any research on that. Yeah. You just kind of went at it without right. needing to research that world. Yeah, and I don't mean to say that to be brazen. I think it's because, I, I think if I felt like I had been writing a novel about missing children, I would have researched it. Mm -hmm. But it did always feel like the backdrop to me. So one of the interesting things about putting a book out in the world is it, many people describe this as a missing child novel. To them, it is not backdrop. It's about a missing child. And I think think it's just such a dramatic event that people instantly think, oh, that's what the book is about. But like I said, I always saw the book being about Lydia's life in the forefront, the missing child in the background, so that the specific details of what happened to Danny, the nitty gritty like CSI type details, um, those never interested me. And the idea of how a community would respond to this or how a family would respond to this or how news media would respond, I just thought about it a lot. I mean, that's why I love writing fiction because you just I just think about things and make it up. Um, luckily, I think I did a fairly credible job of it without the research, but I think, again, if it was going to go into the nitty gritty of what the police did or, you know, uh, more procedural, um, details. I would have done research, but that's not the book I was trying to write. It, it read to me like a book about siblings, mm -hmm. one of which, one of whom is present through his absence. He's right. a very present character right. for someone who is gone. That's really well said. That's really well said. I stopped at some point saying the novel isn't about Danny because the novel is, so Danny's the missing brother. Danny appears uh, certainly in every chapter, if not a ghost of him on every page. But yeah, it's very much about him in his absence and Lydia's coming to terms with who he was as her brother. Um, and I think adolescence is a particularly fraught time for a number of reasons. And I think it's the time when siblings really, really butt heads, um, especially when there's a schism between them as there was between Lydia and Danny, one's popular, one's not, one's more intelligent than the other, one has more ease with the parents than the other. You know, there was a lot of reasons that they would butt head. So I very much saw the novel, see the novel now, even more so in hindsight, as her grappling with Danny in his absence. I have a 16-year-old. I have an older mm -hmm. child who made it safely through adolescence right. and is out the other side. One of the things that I appreciated so much about the dialogue was that you've managed to capture the cadence of mm -hmm. a teenager. Mm -hmm. Those sentences that are written with a period after each word right. in that kind of emphatic, um, dramatic, self-aggrandizing right. style of teenagers. <laughs> do you have a particular interest in the adolescent set or particular experience? I do. I'm fairly fixated. I finally moved on. I'm not writing about adolescence in my next project, but even in my short stories, I've had a fairly consistent fixation on high school, I think for a number of reasons. One, high school characters are so emotionally labile and don't have the best coping skills, so everything's out on the surface. Um, also, um, 
yeah, there's just so much drama in high school. And on a personal level, I just feel like the scars of high school have stayed with me. I'm almost 40, but um, I'm still interested in looking back at that and seeing how does that shape us as adults, which I tried to do at the end of this book. Um, so for all those reasons, it's interested me. It's been funny the number of people who've said to me, do you have a teenage son or daughter because you really captured the voice? And I've had to admit, like, no, I have a teenage inner child that I'm still grappling with. And, and that's where the voice comes from, but it comes very naturally to me. And the narcissism of teenagers fit really well with this story. I mean, Lydia makes herself the center. She is the center of Danny's disappearance in her own mind. So that was a very compelling point of view to write a disappearance story from. So it's your inner teenager talking. Yes, it is my <laughs> inner teenager. But you know, I was also really curious to see that for six or five, six years, you taught a class mm -hmm. to talented youth through mm -hmm. Johns Hopkins on descriptive writing about place, right. right? And I'm wondering if, I don't know what age group that talented youth was, but it sounds as though you've had sustained and significant contact with that age bracket. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and even here at U of O, you know, I'm teaching as a composition instructor, I'm teaching 90% freshmen, and that's still 18, 19 year olds. But yeah, Johns Hopkins, the parallel with Lydia is, you know, a lot of smart kids have a lot of bravado and a lot of defenses built up around their smartness, um, a sense of superiority, but coupled with this great insecurity because many of those kids do not fit in. We, t I taught at this, the, the summer program for Johns Hopkins where all the smart kids are gathered together. So it's this wonderful accepting community and often it's the one place they're not bullied or made fun of. Um, but I think, right, smart kids often, if they're visibly, precociously smart, yeah, build up a sense of superiority in one respect because they are really in superiorly intelligent to their peers, but also just as a defense for the lack of acceptance um, in the typical middle school or high school setting. Yeah, boy, walk down any high school <laughs> corridor and right. that's what's happening. I expect it happens a little bit in your freshman composition classes too until you teach them otherwise. You know, I don't, it's different being the teacher. I don't pick up on the, I think it's different in college. I don't sense people getting ostracized for intelligence once they're in college. There's certainly that the kids who are sort of precociously proud of themselves because they're better read or have a better grasp of what's going on in the world, but I don't have a sense of um, that sense of rank that happens in high school. I think it falls away some in college, but I could just be a little bit more oblivious to it as the teacher. Well, I think they're here because they chose to be here, and that's, right. that's one big right. factor. I'm curious about the relationship between teaching composition and your own creative process. Yeah. Is it a reciprocal uh, relationship, or do you use in class what you've learned from your own kind of autodidactic process? Yeah, you know, I've thought a lot about that. I mean, the one thing that's, there's a few things that are nice. Um, one is that I'm immersed in writing of some sort or another, both in my day job and creatively, and that's nice to be in the realm of writing as my day job. I have spent many years being an office drone and then going home and writing, and it's not the same thing. You don't get the same energy off of it. Um, it's hard to do that. Um, the, so that's nice. The other thing is, I think people have the sense of that creative writing is like no rules. You just go and follow your dreams and, and you write a novel. But it's very rule-laden. I mean, you really have to learn how to creatively write. So I often talk to my students in composition who complain about how rule-laden it is and how structured it is and how how much they have to learn to write a good essay, I often compare it, to, and they'll say, I like writing poems, or I like writing fiction, but I don't like writing this. And I'll often compare the two to say, no, they all have rules. And once you learn the rules, you can start playing with them and tearing them down and interpreting them, but that's how you become a good writer in any realm, is you learn the rules and you master them, and then you get creative. And I think it's that's true in many forms of writing, unless you're a savant and just like sit down and write a novel when you're 19, but that wasn't me. I had to learn the rules. Very few of us. <laughs> right, 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 right. What kind of discipline do you have to impose on yourself to get something written? 
So I'm going to give two answers. So I have a three-month-old baby at home. So before the three-month-old baby, my dis- I was very disciplined. Writing keeps me sane. So my discipline doesn't come from sort of some haughty, look how great I am place. It really is a sort of my mental health treatment. Like I stay sane and grounded and non-depressed when I'm writing regularly. So usually on days that I'm not swamped in teaching or grading, I would used to from about 11 to 3 or 11 to 4, if it was going great, 11 to evening, um, just write. Uh, write new pages, revise pages, just sit with it as long as I could. Now my schedule is when my son Eli naps, I try to write for 15 minutes at the computer. Um, and hopefully that will get, I'll have more and more time to do that. I read several years ago a writer who said, uh, my goal is one good sentence a day, and I have stuck with that. I think one good sentence a day is a great goal because I can write, you know, even if I write three pages, I I feel very lucky, or 10 pages or 20 pages, I feel very lucky if I can get one really good sentence that I'm proud of a day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure the adorable three-month-old Eli has really mixed up your (laughs) daily routines. Absolutely. You were saying at one point that you wrote every day, or when you have a project going, you write every day. Mm -hmm. I suppose even in 15-minute increments that would work. Yeah, and I'm have to. I'm not yet at the everyday piece of it. I think when I'm sleeping more regularly, I'll be back to everyday. But yeah, I want. I do best when I have that sort of continuity. When I return to a project over and over, even taking a day off, there's a re-entry that is a little bumpy. Coming back to you have to sort of reintroduce yourself to the project. So I do best when I am writing every day. That seems really like a far away idealistic goal at this point but yes it will happen (laughs) I assure you it will happen I wanted to ask you one more question about the book just because the contents of it is so fabulous and rich you talked about it early in the interview as a coming of age story and it's certainly been described as that but there is also there is also the older Lydia Mm -hmm. Um, there there's also you talk about the impact of Mm -hmm. this event the disappearance of Danny on the adult or more adult Lydia so so it's more than just about the adolescent. It's more than it just is. about the coming of age. What about the adult, Lydia? So it's interesting because I kind of see her coming of age as an adult. I see a lot of, I wanted to revisit her as an adult because I felt like something as traumatic as what happens to her in her teenage years could not be resolved in her teenage years. And very early on in the writing process, I think I wrote about 15 pages, present tense teenager. And I got about 15 pages in and I thought, and I almost hit a wall and I thought, I don't have much more to, like I don't have room to play around here. I don't have any where to go with this character. And I rewrote those pages from the retrospective narration. I added the part that I read out loud about years later, I was in a support group. I put that in the very beginning to frame it as an adult looking back. Um, And yeah, I still saw it as I mean, I suppose it's an odd way to look at a coming of age since she's 28 at the end of the book, but that's the time that I saw, okay, 12 years later is when she could start to make peace with what happened, when she could start to make peace with members of her family, when she could start to make peace with some of her peers, when she could start to make peace with the situation. So I still, I guess, in my head thought of it as sort of her delayed adolescence, you know, a that she stayed adolescent in many ways about this event, and that's the point where she could resolve some of this. So that's when she came of age, oddly enough. No one's asked me that. That's a good question. Good. (laughs) Thank you. I thought about it uh, quite a lot as I read this. So really, you could also say that the book is about grief and loss and maturation, and sometimes the delayed maturation, perhaps that's triggered by some kind of traumatic event? Absolutely. Beautifully said. Yes, I would agree. (laughs) (laughs) I can't wait to read your next one. (laughs) Okay, I see what you mean. Now, is it fair to ask you about the next one? Can you talk about the next project? I'm really paranoid about sharing ahead of time, but Mm -hmm. I will say that I tried right after I wrote this one to write something radically different, multiple narrators, nothing to do with siblings, um, and I hated it, and I have come back to a, a sibling story. Um, which I guess I just don't have it out of my system yet. It's a very different sibling story, but I'm still working out that subject matter, apparently. 
some of your publicity material and your other interviews have pointed out that you have lived a really great sibling story. You continue to live a great right. sibling story. This, you have a close relationship with your sister? Yes. I have a very close relationship. The interesting thing about writing a book like this is a lot of people assume it's based on a real event. So many people have asked me, do, has someone close to you disappeared? Do you have a brother who disappeared? And again, I mean, I love writing fiction because I make stuff up. and. The big joke with my older sister is we're incredibly close. We still live seven minutes from each other. I've always sort of idolized her my whole life. And all of her friends have said, Rebecca, isn't it really interesting where um, that Miriam wrote a first novel where she kills off the older sibling? <laughs> and um, she and she, so she's had to defend herself to her friends. So that's definitely not some you know, strange Freudian wish of mine to get rid of my older sister. I want to know what Rebecca says in answer to that question. Um, I think I told her to say that the book is dedicated to her, so, yeah. That's a very <laughs> good way to do it. Now that you have a son of your own and you have two nieces, yes. is that correct? Do you think having worked through this exploration of adolescence is going to influence the way you deal with your own boy? Oh, that's a good question. You know, in all honesty, I have to say, I had my heart set on having a girl only because I'm from a family of girls. My sister has two girls. I thought I was going to have a girl, but when I ha when I found out I was having a boy, I thought, hallelujah, I don't have to deal with a teenage girl. <laughs> because I think there's something particularly hellish about female adolescence. And uh, certainly I was not easy on my mother during adolescence. So um, I'm happy for a boy. Well, I've lived through <laughs> two male adolescences and they've been a pure joy. Oh, so I, I wish Very you well good. with Eli. He seems like a fabulous boy. Thank you for coming to do this. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. We'll look forward to having you back when the next one comes out. Excellent. I'd <laughs> okay. love to do it. I wanted to point out to our viewers that you will be doing a reading from the book in yes. March. It's not till March, but you're on at March 4th at 8 p.m. in the Night Library Browsing Room, yes. and you'll be reading from the local news, right? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Miriam, thanks again. Thank you. We've been speaking with author Miriam Gershow who has recently produced the novel The Local News and is an English instructor at the University of Oregon. Thanks very much for watching and see you next time.